Greetings, everyone. Me again, Laszlo Montgomery, with another CHP episode, 206 this time. Today we're going to look at a famous Nederlander. Well, maybe not that famous. For those of you professional or amateur sinologists who uh, have already heard of Robert Van Gulik, this will be a refresher course. And for those of you who haven't, you're in for a treat. Quite a guy. Robert Hans Van Gulik, or Gao Luo Pei, as he was known in Chinese, was one of hundreds of Westerners who achieved renown in his day, 1950s and 60s, for his scholarly work on Chinese culture and history. Now, like the man who loved China, who we featured in a previous two-part series, Joseph Needham, Van Gulick also had this brilliant analytical mind and an ungovernable passion in studying all kinds of aspects of Chinese culture, including the language. Today's hero came from that period when, well, to the average working stiff, China was still an exotic, mysterious place that they only read about in magazines and books. Van Gulick's time was still one where everyday people, like Sly Stone sang about, they didn't think much about going to China any more than they thought about taking a trip to the moon. These places were so much farther away back then than they are today. To the masses outside China, these artists and writers were their main windows into that distant world. Van Gulick was another one of those Westerners who was able to marry his scholarship of China with his literary pretensions and bring something new and quite popular and thrilling. Robert Van Gulick is right up there with all those top-grossing names of 20th century Western sinologists. Over the course of his life, he contributed many scholarly essays and other academic works on all kinds of subjects, from ancient Chinese erotic art, poetry, to gibbons. He would go wander into any niche subject there was. The more esoteric, the better. And he enjoyed the perfect career that allowed him to indulge in this lifelong passion. But all that aside, I guess if you had to point to one thing above all else that this extraordinary man achieved and became best known for, it's the 16 detective novels he wrote where he introduced to the English-speaking world the incredible Judge D, a historic figure from the Tang Dynasty who later on in the 20th century became the alter ego of Robert Van Gulick. Van Gulick was born August 9, 1910, in Zutphen, about 90 minutes by car east of Amsterdam. Thanks to his father, a medical officer in the Dutch colonial army, Van Gulick had one of those interesting and privileged lives we've seen on TV and in The Prince. His father was based in The Hague when Van Gulick was born, but three years later, the family was living in Indonesia, the Dutch East Indies, and he lived in Surabaya and Jakarta called Batavia back then, and that's where his earliest memories were. And it was in Jakarta that Van Gulick, as a young boy, aged 3 to 12, first came into contact with Chinese culture and had an instant fascination. He began studying Chinese during those years and had an obvious gift for languages. By the time the family returned to the Netherlands in 1922, he already spoke four. And at the age of 12... He started high school and came into contact with the famous Dutch linguist and anthropologist Christianus Cornelius Uhlenbeck. Uhlenbeck was famous, among other things, for work he did developing a dictionary of the language of the Blackfoot Indian tribe of Montana and neighboring provinces in Canada. Van Gulick assisted the professor on this work, and in return, Uhlenbeck taught him Russian and Sanskrit. But Van Gulick's first love remain Chinese. By 1934, he had his master's and doctoral degrees in Oriental languages from the University of Leiden. In the years that followed, into his mid to late 20s, he was already acknowledged by his peers as a respected scholar who was taken very seriously. And with this particular skill set, Van Gulick joined the Dutch Foreign Service and, up until his dying day, got to enjoy all the trappings and excitement of being a diplomat. And because of his fluency in Japanese, 
He started off as a secretary of the Tokyo Legation. So 1935, he headed east, taking the Trans-Siberian Express all the way from Europe to the Orient. And his career was off and running. It was one of those postings where well, he had a lot of downtime. And he used these long moments to wander the streets, alleys, and nooks of mid-1930s Tokyo. The place was hopping. It had been four years since the Mukden incident. Manchukuo was already in operation. The Nanjing Massacre was only a couple years away. In other words, it was quite a time to be living in a place like Tokyo, being a Western diplomat, fluent in Japanese, including reading and writing. All the political machinations going on in Tokyo during those critical years, Van Gulick had box seats to that drama. Anyone with a wandering and curious spirit can go crazy in a situation like this. There were quite a bit of, uh, well, let's just say things, that Van Gulick would purchase and collect and study till all hours of the morning. Now, for someone with interests as varied as the art of scroll mounting to the history of erotic art, there were quite a lot of books, objets d'art, and interesting curios he acquired and accumulated. And living in the tumultuous times that he did, he amassed and lost two of his personal collections. And whatever he left behind after his passing was auctioned off by Christie's back in 1983. Now, just because he was in Japan didn't mean he couldn't continue his China studies. That particular yearning to learn more remained undiminished. While in Japan, Van Gulick also began a lifelong passion for playing the guqin. This is a zither-like instrument with seven strings with a history that went back to the San Huang Wu Di, the mythical three sovereigns and five emperors. In other words, it's old. Confucius, like many literati of the day, loved to play the qin. It was part of the skill set a proper gent, you know, back in the Zhou dynasty, should have. They found plenty of these ancient instruments in Chinese tombs dating back to the Zhou era. Now, when you listen to the gu qin, you're hearing music people have been listening to since the beginnings of Chinese recorded history. Yeah, Robert Van Gulick, he loved to play the qin, and he studied it his whole life. So he made the most of this Japan posting. I cannot even imagine how swell it must have been for a 20-something-year-old guy to be in his shoes at, you know, at his age, at that time, at that place, witnessing all the goings-on in Tokyo during the lead-up to and start of World War II. On one of his walkabouts in 1940, he chanced upon this one book while scavenging through some Tokyo back-alley second-hand bookshop. The book was called Wu Zetian Si Da Qi An, Four Curious Cases from the Time of Empress Wu. It concerned the exploits of someone named Di Renjie. There's this genre of Chinese literature called Gong An Xiao Shuo, which is usually translated as detective fiction. Every culture has some form of this or another. And this book Van Gulick chanced upon was one of those. During the Song Dynasty, storytellers who plied their trade in the town squares and tea houses also used to tell these detective stories. And ever since, it's been, well, understandably a very popular genre among the masses, and not just in China. In the world of podcasting, there's dozens of these detective true crime shows that are always being added to the list of great shows. D. Renjie, this Judge D, he was a real person. He lived from 630 to 700, 7th century China. That's the early Tang Dynasty. And D. Renjie, he worked for Wu Zetian, the only woman in Chinese history to rule as an empress in her own name. Her controversial life has served as the richest, most tasty, and fascinating fodder for countless novels, plays, games, movies, TV miniseries, not to mention historical speculation. She was Judge Dee's boss. Now, before we start riffing through the fascinating and bizarre world of these Judge Dee detective novels, let's trace the timeline of Van Gulick's life, and then we'll get back to Dee Renjie. Judge D and Van Gulick's connection to him. 
This first diplomatic posting of Van Gulik came to an abrupt end in 1942 when the Dutch embassy in Tokyo was evacuated following Pearl Harbor. He spent some time in Mozambique as a spy for the British Secret Service, or, or so he indicated once, and then the Dutch government sent him to the temporary wartime capital of China, Chongqing, as first secretary of the Dutch embassy there. And even though that city was famously bombed nonstop for all the years that the nationalists hunkered down there, it didn't stop Van Gulik from once again making the most of his time to further his studies and prowl the markets for interesting acquisitions of items of China cultural interest. I read that even when everyone was hiding out and trying to stay off the streets to avoid Japanese aerial bombing, he'd still go out antique hunting or checking out scrolls, books, and, you know, whatever else caught his eye. Much of what he had already accumulated during his years in Japan had been lost in his haste to vacate the land of the rising sun. While in Chongqing, he also got married. 1943, met a woman named Shui Shifang, the daughter of a senior nationalist government diplomat, also in Chongqing. He was 33 years old when they tied the knot. This was a loving marriage and family with four children, and they all got to see the world, thanks to the nature of Van Gulik's foreign service career. But in Chongqing, he was another face in the crowd of foreigners who followed the nationalist government all the way up the Yangtze to this today largest city in the world. Well, one of them anyway. Now, being in wartime Chongqing might be exciting for anyone, I guess, but to a man of Van Gulick's academic bent and inquisitive mind caught up in those historic times, uh, this must have been pure scholarly bliss. And all the while, as he indulged in all his intellectual passions, he served the Netherlands with great enthusiasm. Besides the normal day-in, day-out diplomatic grind, anything that promoted friendship, commerce, or cultural relations of any kind between his country, the Netherlands, and Japan or China, he was always on board. There are many photos circulating around of Robert Van Gulick and all his diplomatic and military finery. Yeah, he was, he was quite a polished operator. So he stayed in Chongqing until a year after the end of the war, and in 1946, he was recalled back to The Hague. Back home in the Netherlands, he wallowed in all his interests and cultural pursuits while he continued his studies at Leiden University. This included Chinese calligraphy and his ongoing study of the Qin, the Gu Qin. And I guess you could say, even though he was a Westerner living in the 20th century, Robert Van Gulick so idealized the traditional Chinese Confucian gentleman's lifestyle and attitude, the Jinza life, he remained a closet traditional Confucian elite till he breathed his last. Wherever he hung his hat in the world, he always had a perfect scholar's study, filled with surviving mementos of his postings, scrolls hanging, books and books, the full thing. Even the Wenfang Sibao, the four treasures that no traditional Chinese study room was complete without. Bi mo zhi yan, brush, ink, paper, and inkstone. Van Gulick was no dilettante. His calligraphy was really quite good, and he really could play the qin and wrote books on the subject. Following a stint at the Dutch Embassy in Washington, D.C., Van Gulick's next posting took him back to post-war Japan. This was from 1949 to 1953. Other postings were in New Delhi, Kuala Lumpur, and then on to Lebanon. That was from 57 to 61, when he lived in Beirut. Now, thanks to the political situation beginning in 1958, it wasn't a terribly peaceful time there, but relative to what was to follow in the 70s, you could say it was, Beirut was still called the Paris of the Middle East. He served there as Dutch foreign minister for the Middle East. The Van Gulick family lived in this enormous residence that used to be a small Ottoman palace. And as far as his writing went... These were Van Gulick's best years. And then in 1965, Van Gulick capped off his diplomatic career as the Dutch ambassador to Japan, serving in this capacity up until his death two years later in 1967. 
It was probably quite a joy to be someone of Van Gulick's breadth of knowledge about Japan's language, history, and culture, and to be there and watch what was happening then, 1965, 66, 67. If you recall, 1964, the Olympics were held in Tokyo. And just like the 2008 Beijing Olympics that are sometimes called China's coming out party, that's what these 64 Olympics were for Japan. That was the one where Bob Hayes won golds in the 100-meter dash and 4 by 100 meter relay. The only athlete, ladies and gentlemen, who could say they won Olympic gold and a Super Bowl ring, 1972 Cowboys. That was the diplomat part of Robert Van Gulick. But as I said, he was also just as much a scholar and a writer. We already saw how over the course of his career in the Dutch Foreign Ministry, he enthusiastically pursued the life of a Confucian scholar, studying the classics, learning, and aspiring to live his life in the spirit of a right proper Jinzu. So as I already mentioned, in some back alley in Tokyo, 1940, Van Gulick had his fateful encounter with this book, Wu Zetian Si Da Qi An, the four curious cases from the time of Empress Wu, half of which had been translated and published by Van Gulick as Di Gong An in 1949. The English title was The Celebrated Cases of Judge D. Publishers weren't lining up at Van Gulick's door to get a crack at it, so he used his own money and printed 1,200 copies of this translation. Now, this translation of this book he found in a Tokyo back alley served as a kind of template for the 16 Judge D novels that followed. By and large, each of these novels would invariably take him about six weeks to write. And you could say the research was already done and stored in Van Gulick's random access memory, so he churned them out rather fast. Now, don't get Judge D mixed up with Justice Ball. There were also a whole bunch of tales featuring this paragon of Chinese jurisprudence, Justice Bao, Bao Zheng, a northern Song-era scholar official of great renown for his judicial wisdom and incorruptibility. He lived 999 to 1062. During the Ming Dynasty, he also became a popular figure in this Chinese detective novel genre. And he's, of course, also a stalwart in traditional Chinese popular culture. So Judge D, although historically he preceded Judge Bao, he became a popular character later on in the Qing. And these were probably the two most famous judge detectives that made it down to our day. Justice Bao, of course, being the more popular and well-known. He had his own miniseries back in 1993, 2008, and again in 2010. As I said, the backdrop to all these Judge D stories was the Tang Dynasty during Empress Wu's time. The stories may have taken place during the 7th century, but the way that Van Gulick wrote the novels was in a style that was actually popular during the Ming Dynasty, when that anonymous author wrote about Judge D and Wu Zetian. In the celebrated cases of Judge D, there were three cases under investigation. The case of the sealed room, the case of the hidden testament, and the case of the girl with the severed head. All three are reported to, investigated by, solved, and adjudicated by Judge D, and all in one solution. The fictional Judge D, he was a district magistrate who was also a detective, a prosecutor, judge, jury, all in one. He performed undercover work, dressed up in disguises, traveled incognito, he intimidated witnesses and roughed up the uncooperative types. He was a trained swordsman and schooled in the Liu Yi, the six arts that we discussed in that History of Philosophy series, the skills that a Confucian Junzi would have been schooled in. He was also quite accomplished in Chen or Chinese boxing, if you recall that from... Uh, that uh, recent two-part martial arts episode. And what detective of this stature would be complete without a trusty right hand? Holmes had Watson. The Green Hornet had Cato. Batman had Robin. Judge D had Sergeant Hong. Hong Liang. Hong was the best known, but there were three other characters who appeared in all the Judge D novels and assisted him in crime solving. Each one had a particular skill set. They were Ma Zhong, Jiao Tai and Tao Gan. 
Sergeant Hong was always Judge Di's most trusted confidant and quite a master at martial arts. Ma Zhong and Chiao Tai were former Robin Hood-style outlaws. The judge recruited them, and these two provided Judge Di Renjie with occasional muscle. Tao Gan was a former con man and thief who served as a fixer for all kinds of situations. It was quite a team. And in the true Chinese Confucian style, as Judge D went about his business serving the people, he did it with nothing except the highest ethics and in the noblest fashion. And of course, just the right amount of expected arrogance and sense of entitlement, given his station in life. In the books, Judge D is a big man, broad-shouldered, quite a physical presence, long flowing beard. Van Gulik, he was the same. He too was a big man himself. He didn't have the long flowing beard, but he did have a nice mustache and goatee, and both men rose in their careers in the service of their country. Van Gulik starting off at a relatively low ranking post and finished off his career as a full ambassador to a major nation. Judge D began as a magistrate and ended his career as a minister of state. Chinese magistrates, or pan guan, that was a very powerful position back in Judge D's day. You were not only the top judicial official in the city, you were also in charge of maintaining order and collecting taxes. And Judge D and Robert Van Gulick, oh man, did they both ever love Gibbons and playing the guchin. In all his homes while he lived in Asia, Van Gulick always had those apes roaming freely around his residence. They were part of the family. Judge D as well loved him. The historical Di Renjie, he came from Taiyuan, Shanxi province. As I mentioned, he was born in 630, the reign of Tang Taizong. He came from a scholar official family and followed that familiar path that led to a series of judicial positions during the reign of the Gaozong Emperor. But it was really during the reign of Empress Wu, particularly after the founding in 690 of her short-lived Zhou Dynasty, that Judge Di Renjie came into his own. He first came to her notice in 686 while serving out in Gansu province and later became a favorite of Wu Zetian, who promoted him in the government throughout her controversial reign. He was tied very tightly to the reign of Empress Wu and was one of her chief officials. His tomb is located in Luoyang at uh, Bai Ma Si, White Horse Temple, China's first known Buddhist temple, built in 68 AD. You can visit it today. Ever since his passing, Di Renjie joined the multitude of other major and minor Chinese officials who, because of their personal qualities and the way they were written into the official histories, became revered throughout the dynasties as models for posterity. And later on, during the Ming and Qing, thanks to some unknown author, Di Renjie would also gain immortality as a character in this emerging Gong An style of detective vernacular fiction. Van Gulick, he had this hunch that even though Judge D operated in a completely Chinese environment with customs, names, and ways of thinking and doing things that were so foreign to 1950s Westerners, despite all that and all the other glaring differences between China and the nations of the West, there was still an unsatisfied demand in these European countries for this kind of fiction. And he thought he could pull it off and tell the story of this ancient figure from 7th century China and tell it in a Chinese style, but make it appealing and relatable to a reader who didn't grow up with this culture. And not an easy thing to do. So I guess you could point to this as the genius of Robert Van Gulick diplomat, scholar, writer. He was accomplished in all three, but as the one who presented this window into Chinese culture to a non-academic audience, he had quite a large impact. Late 50s, early 60s. Some of us in the internet age are so jaded about the scope of our general knowledge about China, but in those days, when I was a kid, <laughs> you want to learn about China, if your parents couldn't afford a set of encyclopedias, you had to go to the public library to 
look up something or, or have access to books such as these Judge D stories. And this was no Charlie Chan material either. It was written by someone who had nothing except the highest possible respect and love for Chinese culture. And like anyone who's passionate about anything, he wanted to share it with the world and show everyone how great it was. Was this cultural appropriation? Orientalism in the Edward Said sense? Was Van Gulick's work a case of chinoiserie? Well, there's certainly an argument for all that, the way Van Gulick presented this Chinese gong'an detective novel art form in a Western style. Like chinoiserie, it looked Chinese at first, but when you perused it more closely, it wasn't. But you liked it. So Van Gulick launched his Judge D career after receiving halfway decent feedback and encouragement from his friends and colleagues who read that translation of that Ming novel. Based on the public reaction, he decided to start writing his own novels that introduced the stern but fair-minded Judge D. Renjie. This original Ming-era book, Four Curious Cases from the Time of Empress Wu, provided all the inspiration for Van Gulick's own series. His first two books were The Chinese Bell and The Chinese Maze Murders. Fourteen more followed. He most definitely got it right when he said there was a ready audience for this kind of material. He developed quite a big fan base who bought every new title when it came out. The four most famous titles that got the whole Van Gulick treatment were these two plus the Chinese nail murders and the Chinese gold murders. These were his earliest works. They came out between 1956 and 61. And for these first ones, he poured everything he had into them, all his gusto and scholarly devotion. The style of writing is constant throughout, and all of these titles are standalone stories. You don't necessarily have to read them in order, and one doesn't depend on the other to prop up the plot. One of Van Gulick's trademarks became his prodigious use of sex and illustrations featuring naked women and various poses in life and death. These drawings, too, were done in the style that emerged during the Ming Dynasty, 1368-1644. And Judge D was no James Bond who, you know, always got a piece. You'll see, even with all the sex and carnal scenes injected into the book, and the good judge often having to mingle with more than a handful of prostitutes and damsels in distress. You never see him succumb to temptation. A Junzu with a capital Jun. He always remained true to his three wives. His publisher was the one who insisted on the new drawing on the cover, so Van Gulick obliged him and henceforth did all the drawings for all the books himself, for the covers and inside illustrations. Robert Van Gulick was writing these books in the 1950s and 60s. It wasn't the Victorian age, but these books, you know, because of the nudity portrayed on the cover and inside and the racy scenes, were branded by most critics as literary pornography. And with all them smutty pictures on the cover and in between, mom and dad always had to make sure they didn't leave these Judge D books out in the open for the kids to see. These books got stashed in the nightstand next to the bed, not on the family bookshelf in the rec room. Van Gulick, rarely disappointed. One could always rely on the plot to contain plenty of chili and spices intermixed with all this Tang Dynasty murder, mystery, and double-crossing. The critics decimated him. This kind of gong'an literature didn't receive any respect during the Ming and Qing dynasties, and Van Gulick had to endure the same negative reviews and criticism in his time. But the masses... They liked him. These Judge D detective stories found their mark with a lot of fans. And not only with Van Gulick's target audience, Western people. Anyone in the West, including Chinese Americans, Chinese Canadians, overseas Chinese everywhere. Many who chanced upon these Judge D novels wholeheartedly embraced these books. What was there not to like about a Chinese crime-fighting hero from the 7th century? Van Gulick was able to bring to the West this Chinese hero with all these amazing qualities about him who was Confucian, cool and wise, but at the same time knew how to use violence and be a tough guy in the line of duty. 
Like most scholars and academics, Van Gulik had a thing about accuracy. These Judge D novels provided a pathway to readers into this imaginary world, infused with Van Gulik's scholarship, where real-life historical figures mixed with all kinds of genuine character types created in Van Gulik's imagination. And it all took place during this fabled period of Chinese history during the Tang Dynasty, this time of Wu Zetian, Empress Wu. They came from his imagination, and they didn't. The stories weren't manufactured in Van Gulik's mind. He actually learned of most of the cases from ancient documents. All he did was take the real-life case from over a thousand years ago and embellish it and use his writing style to finish it off. In 1956, Van Gulick had translated a 13th century manual of jurisprudence and detection called Tang Yin Bi Shi. In English, Van Gulick called it Parallel Cases from Under the Pear Tree. And these crimes that Van Gulick wrote about were all civil in nature, not conspiracies or grand acts against the state or the emperor. They were about murder, rape, grisly crimes of all shapes and sizes. That was always more popular with the masses. Using the original formula from the celebrated cases of Judge D, in all subsequent Van Gulick novels, there's always a three-ring circus, three cases always going on simultaneously, often interconnected. You see, Van Gulick had this thing about detective novels and that Well, in real life, crime solving didn't happen one case after the other. Crimes were being committed every day, and there was always a need to work on multiple cases at any one given time. And in Judge D's case, as per the formula from that first celebrated cases of Judge D, translated by Van Gulick, there were always three stories going on that the judge and his gang of four were working on. Buddhism, Taoism... Van Gulick was most interested in both religion and his books always had plenty of Taoist and Buddhist characters, often the unsavory type. Judge D himself, being Confucian through and through, perhaps had a kind of built-in disdain or skepticism. It was probably more directed against Buddhism since uh, that was a foreign import rather than a homegrown religion such as Taoism. In fact, Judge D had a rather deep fascination about Taoism. The novels that followed up until his death had names like The Night of the Tiger, Murder in Canton, The Phantom of the Temple, Murder on New Year's Eve, The Emperor's Pearl, and his final title, published a month before his passing, The Necklace and the Calabash. They weren't any different from Miss Marple, Hercule Poirot, or Sherlock Holmes. They were classic whodunits. In the Judge D. books, one could get a nice vernacular dose of Chinese culture injected with all the scholarship and authenticity that someone with Van Gulick's background could bring to the reader. Who knows if Van Gulick's descriptions of early Tang society were on the mark or not, but he didn't just make things up. The fiction was written based on historical evidence gleaned through his own research. Some people might have turned their noses up at Van Gulick's work, but it's important to give him credit for being this this channel that was able to authoritatively package up this sliver of Chinese culture and present it to a non-Chinese audience. An audience of mid-20th century China curious people who didn't have the interest level or smarts to read the books and papers churned out by, you know, the China academics of the world. For most, these books and others like them were the only window to the Far East. Robert Van Gulick didn't limit his writing to these Judge D detective novels. I mentioned his interests covered everything about traditional China. Not so much the 20th century, though. And he wrote these essays, short stories, and not a few coffee table books as well. His most famous one, perhaps, is Zhong Guo Gu Dai Fang Nei Kao, the English title being A Preliminary Survey of Chinese Sex and Society from 1500 B.C. to 1644 A.D. His Lore of the Chinese Lute was a labor of love written about this instrument, this Gu Qin, Gu means ancient, this ancient Qin that he just loved to play. And Judge Di, too. 
He also produced a book on Chinese pictorial art and a book on Gibbons, and that came out right when he passed in 1967. Besides all these better-known obscure works, he published a bunch of other vanity projects and limited editions that he would self-print and pass out to his friends and colleagues. He was extremely prolific. As far as what was so characteristic about these Chinese-style Gong'an detective novels, Van Gulik identified five things that he said described how Chinese crime stories invariably went. First, as I said, the detective is usually the local magistrate who is solving multiple crimes at any one time. Second, you always know right from the get-go who the criminal is. So it's told from that angle of already knowing who done it. Third, and most famous, I guess you could say, supernatural events are common. Ghosts have walk-on roles all the time. In Chinese detective stories, they were omnipresent. Van Gulick used them more sparingly in his novels. Fourth, it's inevitable that philosophical digressions get woven into the fabric of the story, and sometimes whole passages from the classics are read. It's pretty tedious. The last thing that Van Gulick said is characteristic of a Chinese crime novel was that the length of the dramatist personae is as long as your arm. Lots of characters. More than you're used to. And one other thing, you know, when punishment ever got meted out, <laughs> it was rarely ever not gruesome. In his 16 Judge D novels, Van Gulick stuck to this formula that made these Chinese Gong An detective stories so compelling and addictive. He had come to master the Chinese style of writing and tweaked it in ways that he thought would make it more recognizable or relatable to a foreign reader. That was where his specialness lay. He wanted to offer something interesting and authentic that showed his Western readers a sunny side of Chinese culture. He was cognizant of all the damage content like Fu Manchu, for example, was doing in leading the masses to believe that Chinese were all sinister and it put Chinese culture in a dark light. Just like Laszlo Montgomery, he supplied lists of all the Chinese names to give his readers a helping hand. Besides the drawings, Van Gulick also supplied illustrated maps of all these fictional locales where the stories took place. He had all the bases covered. The readers weren't left stranded with all these Chinese names. As part of the research that went into this episode, I checked on YouTube to see if any halfway decent Judge D movies were available for free. There's a recent one with uh, Andy Lau called Detective D and the Mystery of the Phantom Flame. Choi Hark's 2010 release won a whole bunch of awards. Andy Lau as Judge D, Karina Lau as Wu Zetian, and fight sequences choreographed by the great Sammo Hong. I only saw bits and pieces of this film. And as I'm recording this in August 2018, the number two movie in China right now is Di Ren Jie or Si Da Tian Wang, Judge D and the Four Heavenly Kings. Choi Hark again, new from Hua Yi Brothers. I should have mentioned this, but Judge D, Detective D, interchangeable. You say tomato, and I say tomato. In this latest film, Di Ren Jie is lined up against Wu Zetian. Lots of CGI. Looks promising, but it's only showing in two theaters near me. And the word near is in quotation marks, if you know what I mean. The movie I found for free on YouTube in its entirety was a campy 1974 Judge D film based on Van Gulick's book, Judge D and the Monastery Murders, starring none other than one of the great yellow face actors of his day. Good old Kai Day. Lovers of the original Hawaii Five O will remember Kai Day. He played Stephen Dano's nemesis, Wo Fat. He was also Four Finger Wu in Noble House. Looked Chinese to me. How was I supposed to know his real name was Kenneth Dickerson? But that Anglo Egyptian Sudanese mix that he had, ah, the producers in Tinseltown said, Who's going to know? And with a stage name like Kai Day, that'll do the trick. He didn't have the long, flowing beard in the movie, but he sported a nice little scraggly one. And all three of his wives, who are also in the movie, none of them seem to mind. <laughs> There's even a scene of all four of them in the sack. I'm going to put a link to this uh, Judge D film on my website. You get a nice 40-year-old Hollywood makeover of a Van Gulick novel. 
Mako, Irene Tsu, Key Luke, and one of my all-time faves, the great James Hong. Still going strong at 89 years old. I should do an episode on him. See if you can catch the two scenes in the movie where uh, Judge D is shown bowing with incense to the altar of his ancestors. And <laughs> the painting of his ancestors, that, that well-known one of Han Gaozu, the uh, Han Dynasty founder. Robert Van Gulick once said to a close confidant, Judge D is me. Despite the 12 centuries that separated them, these two did have several similarities, least of which were a love of gibbons and the chin. In his writing, he lived his life vicariously through the crime-solving ace de Rengier, and he conducted his life as he believed Judge D might have. He once wrote, quote, Doesn't everybody lead a double life? On the one hand, the actual daily routine. On the other, the life we imagine we ought to be living, if we could only summon that extra bit of courage. End quote. He could hardly find a photo of Van Gulick where he wasn't puffing on something or other. He loved his cigs, and they ultimately did him in. He died of lung cancer in 1967 while serving as the Dutch ambassador to Japan. He was only 57. He crammed all that scholarship and achievement into what was, well, even then, half a century ago, considered a rather truncated life. Well, after he passed, his books sort of went out of print, and he soon became more or less forgotten, except for a niche audience of, you know, guys like Nick Stember. But in 1976, his first work, that 1956 translation of Di Gong An, The Celebrated Cases of Judge D., it got a re-release, and from the wave of popularity that emerged from that first book, a whole new generation of Judge D. lovers gave Van Gulick a second coming. This fueled enthusiasm for the whole back catalog, and now you can pretty much get everything he wrote on Amazon and other uh, online booksellers. I'll put a link to as many as possible and you know list them all uh, by publish date. And I'm not saying Van Gulick was responsible for Judge D becoming a multimedia superstar in the greater Chinese community, but, well, I'm sure all those detective novels he produced had at least some impact in his role in Chinese popular culture. So, that was Robert Hans Van Gulick. Hooray for the Netherlands. Here at the CHP, you'll have to indulge me as I bring you all these episodes that feature all these Western scholars and past lovers of China. Robert Hart, Carl Crow, Ricci, Shawl, Von Bell and Verbeest, Sidney Rittenberg, Norman Bethune, Backhouse, Needham, Jack Jones, William Mesney. Some were more historic than others, but eh, sometimes it's interesting to... Talk about Chinese history using these foreigners as a prism to view it. Well, for me, anyway. So, that's going to be it, my friends. Thanks to all of you who made it this far. Please dispose of properly. Laszlo Montgomery here, signing off from a baking hot day here in L.A. I'm telling you, even in southern Libya or Algeria, they'd be complaining. 105 outside. Wherever it is by you, I hope you're doing great and enjoying this nice summer. More next time, I assure you. Take care, everyone, and do consider coming back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.